shit. I was fucking terrified, but I was like somehow, I was like, whew, fucking invisible, dog. Dave, Dave you, do you like that, that Sapir just said, this was my favorite game? <laughs> <laughs> that's what he just said. Dude, that's what he just oh, said, dude. right? Isn't that fucking amazing? Like, just think about how extraordinary that is. It's such a different state of consciousness that you guys were in. The, the mode of consciousness that... We now bring you Enter the Freud. Warning, this is for entertainment purposes only. It is no way medical advice. Listen at your own risk. Man, okay, so Dave, let me introduce you to Sot Beer. Sot Beer. Hi, so hey Sot Beer, how's it going? What up, Dave? Where are you at? Uh, I'm just in Venice right now, probably like five minutes from the beach. Oh, sweet. Yeah, it's well, funny. Cool. Right behind me is a uh, Venice High, like right up the street, if you know the area. Okay, I don't know too well. A little bit, yeah. And what's right behind you in uh, that picture? Right behind you. Oh, dude, this is our this is our temple. I'm actually at my buddy's house, but I'll, I'll take credit for it. This is a dope picture. Um, so this is like the temple in Amritsar. It's like the Sikh's most precious yep. temple. Uh, where we went to school. I was there like in that city for like four or five years. And uh, I'm sure Poor has a lot of stories <clears throat> from that area as well. Yep. Yeah, well, you guys, I have a little surprise for you. I got super <laughs> fucking bad COVID last night. And oh my God. Yes, dude, I have a fever right now. I'm like delusional, actually. Oh shit, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. This, this, is, this is perfect for... Fucking telling old tales from India? That sounds about yeah. like you want to be a little bit out of your mind. Just a little Dude, bit. exactly. I thought, <clears throat> as I was, I couldn't sleep last night because my, my skin is on fire. And I was like, mm. oh, dude, this is perfect. I'm going to be in an altered state talking to you guys. But so, uh, dude, has anybody got an idea where we're going to start this thing? Well, I, I, I mean, I... I, I don't know if there if you have any either of you have any good ideas, but just I think just kind of sharing like uh, what the daily experience was like. I think it's such a radically foreign, different world from what more most people are used to. So I think for you guys just to like share what it was like to be there, and I've been trying to do it with uh, just porn, but I think having for porn to have someone to like uh, bounce echo back and forth, I think will be awesome. Oh fuck yeah! Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have a I have a few ideas about. Um, I mean, I can just I can start with even just like my little intro to India, kind of like the perception of what I thought it was going to be like, and then the reality of what it was when I rolled up there. Hell yeah! Yeah, cool. um, yeah do that. <clears throat> so, when I was about seven years old, I think I was actually six when my brother first started going to India, and I have an older brother who's like two and a half years older than me, and I just wanted to be with him because, like, you know, all of a sudden he was gone. I had the idea about India because my brother was already there. Um, I was living in Boston, outside of Boston, in an ashram um, as a little kid. And my brother would come back from India, you know, every every break. And he would tell me about, oh, the crazy shit he was getting into. And, uh, you know, all the sweets and, like, candy you could get over there. And, and you know, the ladies would try and like force you to shower, like the matrons who would kind of take care of like the little boys. And he was like, yeah, dude, I can not shower for like weeks. And I was like, what? Uh, but anyways, it sounded fun because it was just like this, this idea of this world where you had different rules and you could kind of like get away with shit if you were smart and clever. And he was already like kind of teaching me all the tricks of like what you had to do in India. So he painted this picture of this place being you know, super exciting. And it was, you know, I, I mean, my, in my, in my house, we had, you know, pictures of India with like elephants and, you know, like fucking the golden temple and, you know, our Sikh gurus and all these things. So I was like, Oh shit. Like, you know, you know, you're living in new England and it's kind of like, it is what it is. And this, this idea of India is so fucking grand. And so anyways, <clears throat> when I was like, I was seven or eight when I made this deal with my dad, cause I was asking him if I could go to India and he's like, well, if you go to India, you got to commit to going for three years. Um, I was like, yeah, okay. So my dad and I, we had this whole agreement. We would just like shake on it and then it was a thing. Like, you know, you just honor your word. That was like the thing my dad and I always had. And hmm. so eventually, you know, I'd be hanging out with some Punjabi people in our community, some Indians. 
and they'd be like teaching me a little bit of Punjabi, Hindi, and like, you know, just cause like I was gonna be going to India. And then, you know, finally the day arrived when I was going and, you know, you get on the airplane and you load up your backpack with all this stuff. And my brother's like, yeah, you gotta bring this, you gotta bring sodas, all this stuff that you can't get in India, you're trying to load on your backpack. And then, you know, <laughs> you know this is back in the, in the late, actually this was 1990 when I first went. So, you know, back then they let the parents come through the boarding gate and like they would hang out with you until it was time to go. And then you just kind of walk down that, uh, you know, pathway um, <clears throat> onto the plane. And then I remember when we landed in India, um, you know, first thing it's like you land and it's so fucking hot when you're on the plane, like just on the tarmac mm. and all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're fucking spraying, you know, the aisles, they're spraying the aisles with all this shit. I, I should take a step back to be like, okay, this one year, I think this was the last year we did this. We, and poor, I'm sure was on the same fucking flight because back then we used to all meet up in New York, like, cause there yep. were the West coast kids. East yep. Coast kids, and from wherever else you were in the States, we'd all like meet up in New York and get on this flight. And the first year I went, we actually flew to London and we're on Air India. And it was like, the, like you know, you're on like a nine hour, eight hour flight, whatever it is to get to get to Heathrow. And I just remember like seeing like a staff member. My first memory was there was this black kid named Hari Singh. And he was kind of like this problem child over there in India. And one of the teachers, like he'd already been there for a year or so before me. I just remember seeing one of the like Western teachers, like somebody from the States, this woman, um, she was like Benji. She came and she just kicked this kid in the ass right in the airport. I was like, oh shit. Like, like that was the first time I saw something that I was like not used to seeing. I was like, okay, cool. And on that same trip, like there was all these like skater kids and you know, my brother was big into skateboarding and I had started skating with him too. And you know, we'd be practicing our always and shit. But the first time we rolled up in the airport and there's kids doing fucking uh, board slides on the on the luggage carousels, like, you know, there's a hundred plus kids with maybe two or three staff members and these kids are just like shredding the airport and that was like, holy <laughs> shit, like, what is this place? Like, I was so shocked. And then same thing, like, kids would be like stealing sodas and little bottles of alcohol on the plane and just like skating down the aisle, like up in the air on the airplane. So it was just like this lawlessness place that I like was not used to, but you know, everybody else was like, I was probably like one of the youngest kids, you know, going over there at the time. So you have all these kids like Purin who have already like been there for six, seven years and they're already fucking insane. And these are like the guys that were like, Oh yeah, this is this guy's little brother. And they like, you know, grab you and like slap you around. But it was all like this kind of cool vibe when we showed up there. And then I just remember when we landed, after we landed in India, uh, you know, you gotta wait to get your bags and all that stuff. And I remember I first stepped out of the airport and I was expecting to see like jungles and fucking panthers and tigers and all that stupid shit in India. And uh, <clears throat> I remember just seeing like motorcycles, everything was filthy. There were scooters, bicycles, and just tons of people, like a lot of like flickering tube lights. And I had to use the bathroom right outside the airport. And I go into the bathroom and I'm stepping over dudes that are asleep on the tile floor with like dripping water. And I was like, God, dude, it was just like so shocking. <laughs> so far away from what I thought India was going to be and then what it actually was. <clears throat> and at that point, this is before we started taking trains and everything. So we would just roll up. They would send like two buses out to pick up all the kids. And you just schlep like all your like 80 pound duffel bags up onto the roof racks and you know, you load up, you know, a few hundred bags on top of these buses, get in the bus and then you're going. So you're like really like 36 hours or 48 hours of straight travel before you grow up in the actual school where, where it's all yeah. walled in and there's gate guards and all that stuff. But it was just like, it's just so fucking overwhelming, just like the, and the smells and all the shit. Like I just remember looking at the bus and it's just like something totally different. Wow. Bro, Dave, are you going to send your kid to this school? <laughs> well, the d d shredding in the airport, that sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. As, Sapir, as you start to re relay the, the unusual lawlessness and the actual, like, lived experience of better than Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn reality, like, that's... That, that's so crazy, man. Like, which school did you go to first? Which one did you land in? So it's funny. I was going to send you this video. I fucking worked on it till like one in the morning, uh, you know, earlier today. And I fucking uploaded this shit to, to YouTube and it was just taking so long. And then when I woke up, it hadn't uploaded. I was like, fuck. 
But anyways, I, that was like my little surprise for you was just a walk through the first school where you went. Oh and when, my God. So, so I'll have to send that to you guys. Uh, I mean, it's just such a rough edit. I just threw everything down on a timeline and just like chose a couple little little things, but it's not cleaned up or anything. But I just thought for perspective for Dave and even for you pouring, like that's actually what got me to go back and check out India was oh, okay. my boy, my boy D went there because his wife had some conference in India. So they just made a little side trip and went to the school and they went to the second school, not the school that you went to, the school that I rolled up at. And he just did a walk through uh, with a camera, very chill. And I was just like, oh, like it brought up so many memories and it was like shocking just to see like the structure of the buildings. And, you know, some stuff had changed, but a lot of it was still original from back when I was, you know, there in the nineties, like they hadn't wow. put more money into it really. But anyways, I, I rolled up there, uh, 1990. So it was actually the second year of GRD. You guys had just shifted down the year before from up okay. in the hills. And now we're down in, it's called Dune Valley in Derdun. And so essentially our view from the school was looking back up at the mountains where Purin and all the older kids were for, you know, many years before. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. Bro. What, so, so, so you, you went and saw GNFC because it's, it's pretty alarming. How much do you think your parents paid to send you to that school? What do you think per year? I mean, I mean, it was, you know, end of the eighties, nineties. Uh, I think what they were paying back then was about 5k plus you had to buy a ticket and then also, you know, all your expenses. So Back then, I, I think most parents would drop probably around eight or nine grand per kid. That, that's just I, a rough estimate. Yeah, that's that's what you that's what you think. But back in the GNFC, it was two grand, bro. Two grand oh, to, wow. to two grand to pay for a kid for an entire year. And Room, board, education, food, everything. All of it, bro. All of it, and because they were so corrupt, only five hundred dollars essentially was getting to the school. And so we had massive hunger strikes and like th there were some days where, because they, they were trying to extort the money from this this 3HO company. The, the people who took the money from our parents would then not give the money to the school. And so then they would periodically starve us and give us like, breakfast would be like two pieces of white bread that were singed on kerosene lamps. <laughs> and it's just like, like, what were they doing? Right? Like, well, it's interesting point that you bring up because that was one of the clips I put in the video that I wanted you to see. And oh. that was the primary issue. Okay. So first of all, we know Darshan, your, your boy, yeah. that was his main issue. He was like, look, you know, there was so many great things about the school, but you kind of get caught up in like, this is a pretty low level thing to do, to be like, you know, you're essentially, that's like what fucking animals do. You know, their life is about finding food and eating it. Yeah. And it's like, how do you have all these like other like things going on when your primary focus is like get enough fucking calories. It's the same shit in prison too. You gotta get enough fucking food. Otherwise you go into the survival state and that's kind of, you know, that's what we did in India. And it was a little bit different in GRD because yeah. we had a little more resources, a little more food there than you guys did. But at the same time, I was like, bro, I became a straight fucking criminal. I was, I, I had a fucking blazer with an inner pocket and I was a junior guy. So, you know, I, I would go into the, the dining hall before all the other seniors. There was 450 kids there when I was there and it was a pretty small school in comparison to where Purim was. But I was like sneaky fucking fingers. Like I was throwing fucking puffs in my pocket, cornflakes, fucking uh, fried potatoes, tickies. You just fucking get your hands were really fucking slick, man. And like, look, you knew the consequences. Like if somebody saw you like doing like what I was doing every fucking day, you would get a ass whooping like you wouldn't believe. And then the other kid, like, you know, some other kid went hungrier that day. Like, oh, name it out. Like I didn't, yeah, yeah. You'd, have to, you'd have to beg. Like, and they'd think, oh, is this fucking kid lying? They're trying to slap you again. But like, for me, I like, it's just so fucking cheeky like that. And then it was like the, the joking version of that when your boy was sitting across from you like this and you'd be like, oh, like you do some little like tactic to make him like lose his focus and like turn around and see what's going on. Like, oh, Luther, he slapped that kid. And everybody's like, oh, shit. And you're like straight up eating off his plate or you like grab something <laughs> and like your mouth is full like a fucking, uh, 
you know, little squirrel, but like all your buddies are like dying laughing because this kid was like so stupid to turn around. And like, so the move was you would turn around, but you'd cover up your food like this. So nobody yeah. could like grab out your plate. But yeah, the food issue was, I mean, any way you could do it, man, you just had to be super intelligent about, you know, like how am I get these snacks? Like, you know, <laughs> do I need to rob the calf? Do you break into somebody else's package? That was the other thing that was a huge part of it. Like, <clears throat> like thieves weren't tolerated, like amongst us. Like if you were a thief, like you'd get a thrashing for sure. Like it was not okay. But if you were stealing food, it was because some other motherfucker had it and you needed to get it. And that was okay. You could steal yep. food, but you couldn't steal like currency. Like you couldn't steal money yep. or like possessions, but food didn't count because everybody knew it was like, you just need that. And you were being a little bitch because you weren't sharing. So you should have your stuff stolen. That was the whole <laughs> whole idea there. Yeah. Yeah. I like that code. Dave, Dave, <clears throat> what, dude, what, do you remember having like, a scenario when you were a kid where you were hungry or like how what was it like being back here as like a counterpoint <laughs> no never ever in my entire life was i ever hungry for any reason other than just like i was outside playing too long and then you'd be hungry and you'd go run into your house and eat whatever the hell you wanted are you serious yeah the the, the idea of hunger uh, like that's out of my control is totally i've never experienced that in my entire life dude that, that well, is <laughs> yeah it's it's pretty interesting because i mean for me like if i go into intermittent fasting now or something it's super normal like i was like i know what it's like to go for extended periods of time without eating food and your mind goes through some basic little things like oh like you should probably eat now you're, like, yeah, you're fine but that's something that i learned how to do in india was <clears throat> Like I'd play all these mental games with myself. I'd have like the shittiest food on my plate and it's like a crusty cold chapati or whatever. But I used to sit there and I was miserable because it was terrible. But I, I remember I'd put it in my mouth and I'd start chewing on it and I'd pretend this is the last piece of food I was ever gonna eat in my life. And I would like make up this game that it was gonna be the best tasting thing I ever had. And I was gonna fucking enjoy it and guess what? that turning that shit on in your mind actually made the food taste that much better. And you, you come up with this thing of like, Oh, like gratitude for like, for having this little thing. But it was like, you had to like force yourself into things like that all the time, or you just weren't going to maintain Like, cause you know, you were not going home for nine months and yeah. I would talk to my parents for an entire year. I mean, sometimes you get a fax or you would be able to go out to town and like make a call and call your parents. But it was like the middle of the night. So it was like, maybe you'll reach them. But <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you just had to do all these things like that just to like, otherwise you were going to like fold and crumble. So it was kind of like you could harden yourself up or you could like let yourself go. And you, you'd see kids do it all the time. Kids that just fucking couldn't deal with it anymore. The, like, what would happen? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> and this is fucked up because it's always like the new guys that this happened <laughs> to. So if you had somebody like, like me, I had an older brother who was always looking out for me. Like, you know, like I, I'd fall into some shit and then he'd come and like slap me out of it or be like, dude, come on and try and hype me up and like, you know, make me feel better. And that was always good. But like for the kids that didn't have that, they would just like kind of bug out. There's one kid and it was funny cause I used to fight with this kid all the time cause he was like three or four years older than me but he was a pussy for his age. So like all yeah. the seniors, were, all the seniors would be like, oh yeah, you fuck this fool up. And they would just like tell me I could beat this kid up. So I'd be like, okay. And like clearly, you know, when you're a kid, three or four years is fucking huge. Yeah. But if you get like enough confidence and then you're fighting kind of like a weaker or older kid, like, yeah, you could totally do it. So I remember this kid, it was his first year and he had just come to this place where he just fucking couldn't do anything. He just wanted to escape and he, he had it, you know, he was like going to reading books and stuff. And I remember he skipped night prep. Um, it was like study hour after dinner. And he just wanted to like hide in this little fucking hole and read his book. So I saw him climb into the dirty laundry. Cause we saw like, you know, you're in a room with 20 kids at this time, this was a smaller room with 20 kids. And then there was another dorm that we shared a balcony. So there was like essentially 40 people's clothes that are piled up the night before they come and take Dobie. You'd have to throw your laundry out on the balcony. And then the person came to collect the laundry. And so there was this huge pile of clothes and I saw him, crawl in there with a book and a flashlight 
to escape. And, and this is like an older kid. He was probably like, I want to say at the time he was probably in eighth grade, maybe ninth grade. I don't know. He's probably eighth grade. Anyways, he climbs in there with a flashlight in his book. And I was like, what the fuck is wrong with this kid? Like, <laughs> that is so fucking disgusting to climb in all this dirty laundry. And I remember telling one of the older kids, I was like, dude, this fucking guy climbed in the fucking laundry. He's in there. And my this older kid's like, what the fuck? There's a kid in there right now? So he just grabbed a bucket of water, like a five-gallon bucket, and just fucking threw it right on the laundry. And we could just hear the kid crying in there, and he didn't even fucking come out. We're like, what the <laughs> <laughs> so so it's like funny like we're dying laughing about this shit but like like yo like what if that was you what if that's like how you dealt with shit like you just couldn't come out it's it's fucking crazy you know what i mean and that kid was always like hiding places and he was one of the mm-hmm. kids that could go under the radar you know what mm-hmm. i'm saying like you kind of didn't know about him because he was quiet and shy but not a place not a place for introverts man not at why, all. He, why did you say that, oh, there was this kid that's older than you and you would fight with him? Like, like that's just normal. Like, is that is that, like, in your memory? Because I know in GNFC, for sure, like, fist fights was pretty much, like, standard. But then, like... By, by the time you got there, was it... Was that really a... Well, like I, on, I think... It, on, I think it's the kind of like trickle down effect. I mean, you guys were raised by an older group of people that were fucking insane. And then you guys yep. did the same shit to us. And then we did it the same thing. But it kind of like started to filter out after my generation from what I've heard. Like, you know, we'd still kind of like hype up our little kids to be like, you know, fighters. And occasionally if, if there was kids that were talking shit. And, and that's the problem I have with kids today. And it's not like a hate on them or whatever. It's just if you talk some serious shit and this is like my godson, he's... You know, he's 10 years old, and that was the whole thing. You could talk as much shit as you want, but the moment you kind of cross the line, you have to get in there and fucking prove, back up everything you're saying, otherwise you're full of shit and you're a little fucking bitch. Like, that's just how it went. So, uh, obviously, like, that's still an issue I have, and, like, I'm sure I'll get over it at some point, but if you talk shit, you had to get in there. And I was a serious Mm. fucking shit talker, so I always had to fight. And same thing, I, I used to fight... Uh, I used to fight kids in my brother's class all the time. But the cool thing about me was I always knew that my brother was a good fighter. He was older. So I couldn't get into that much trouble. Like, yeah, maybe I'd kind of it would be a draw or I'd, I'd lose a little. But I'd never lose, like, a lot because I knew he was coming. Like, if I got beat up too bad, that kid had to, like, <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? Like, he was going to have to deal with my brother if he thrashed me up too bad. So I right, always had right. this extra little bit of confidence when I was fighting just to be like, yeah, like, no matter what, this guy, this kid's getting fucked up, you know, by me or my brother, so it's fine. <laughs> Dave, Dave, was that how it was with you and your brother? <laughs> I'm just checking, well, man. I want to check my, it. My, my brother beat me up uh, <laughs> from time to time. Um, but no, like, the, the, I, I grew up in Minneapolis. I went to a, your average school in Minneapolis. Like, I, I honestly, except for my brother beating me up occasionally, I never got in a single fight my entire life. That's amazing. How often were you guys fighting? Was it once a day, once a week, once a month? How often were you guys fighting? <laughs> I, I, think it was, I think it was cyclical when fighting became a thing. Like, every once in a while, there hadn't been a fight for a minute, and then there would be, like, a few days of a lot of fights. And oftentimes, it was kind of, like, the same way you see that shit on, like, UFC, where there's, like, a big fucking ticket. So there's a bunch of fucking kids that get into a fight and then like, it's usually because these, this, you know, these two people started fighting and then they're like, oh, this fucker needs to fight too. And then you'd throw him in there with another bastard and they might be friends or you just think like, you know, the older kids would just be like, okay, look, no, 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 like this isn't fair. That's going to be too much. So they'd really try and like rank it based on size and, and um, the idea that if you could beat this kid then you should be able to beat so-and-so and so. So there was like, somebody kept the record of it. And be like, oh no, I could fuck that kid up because I stomped this dude's head out and he didn't stand a chance, but that guy already beat that kid. So it was very much like, let's try and, and every once in a while you'd find a guy like, oh shit, that kid could fight. Um, but I don't think, I don't think anybody really wanted to do it, but there was just like these older kids that like made it kind of fun. And then like, it was still like, okay, like, you know, I had bruises on my entire body all the time. And it could have been from, you know, jumping off a building or getting kicked by a fucking cow or, you know, we, we were doing stupid shit all the time. It's, it's not like today. And 
<laughs> I think that's the thing that kind of sucks about some of our training in India is it sets you up for this world that doesn't exist in America. Like, I was like, when mm -hmm. am I, I going to see some cool shit? And like, I never do. I'll see like a car accident. I'm like, oh, but there isn't just like this, like jungly shit going on everywhere you look. Man, it seems like it seems like the fighting is like this in a big part of like the social fabric and hierarchy. And it's like the sport and it like places. It seems like it was a big part of your community. I, I think it was. And, and the big part was, you know, you had an issue with somebody, you'd throw down, you'd fight and then it would be over. And you'd, it would be like mutual respect. Like you'd like hug it out. There wasn't really this ongoing thing of like, oh yeah, fuck that dude. Like I'm going to get him back later. It was just kind of like you had the fight. It was done. There's a pecking order. You kind of knew your place. Yeah. And mm. uh, yeah, it, I mean, that's, and, and I think I've heard Purin talk about this before, like the social structure of it all. Like what happens when there aren't these hovering parents that tell you how you're supposed to behave in this environment? Essentially, like we had so much time to explore that where there was nobody checking up on us. Like, yes, you had to be here for assembly. Yeah, you had to be here for meals. You had prefects who used to like kind of keep you in line and be, oh, hey, when is the beer? Ah, why are you, you bunking? Huh? And if you were like missing from like an event, you would get in trouble. But, you know, there was just all this room within. It's, it's the same thing like a fucking jail. Like you had to be in your bed at lights out. If you weren't there, they'd start looking for you. And if you were gone for extended time, you were going to get in serious fucking trouble. It's weird. The way you guys are talking about this fighting, it actually sounds like normal and almost even healthy i'm having these images of like being down at a dog park i don't know if you guys ever go to a dog park but there'll be like 20 dogs running around and they're just running around wild and playing and then every so often there's like a fight and but they and they just fight super viciously but they sort it out real quick and then they just go back to playing and it sort of just seems like it's a normal natural healthy part of the social organization and the way you guys are talking makes it sound like that almost like this is way the way humans in terms of nature naturally are and so i don't know if there's any truth to that because then there's this other thing about these kids bugging out and that it sounds fucked up and traumatic yeah well bro that that like <laughs> I, I was gonna jump in and then and then my like woozy covid my COVID brain can't even finish. I can't even c pick up the thought. Sot Bear, you got you to gotta chime in, bro. Yeah, I think it's pretty normal. Um, you know, I think it's pretty normal to fight like that. I, um, I don't know. Some dorm room, dorm room activities, dude. I mean, yeah, I, I feel like it was probably different from everybody. But for me, it was just... Yeah, it's just it's just super normal. Bro, do super you normal would be scrapping like that? Stop here. Do you remember like you know how dogs often when they when they growl at each other to like establish a ranking, they're not really doing a dog fight like the real kind of dog fight, you know? Like I sure. I think it, in India there was probably you know 5 to 1 little like I punch you and I establish some little thing where I'm like what the fuck? But then it rarely would get into those actual like UFC and or a spontaneous thing that just pops off and you're like for real trying to fuck the dude up, right? Like I think. Well, I I I can't really agree with that because I remember clearly the thing was it was that whole concept of like you know get him to say uncle they tap out that kind of thing. Uh huh. And I remember I did that. I, I submitted this kid who was in my brother's class. He's this Indian guy. It's funny. They actually gave me the nickname of this kid because I thrashed him so badly. Um, so essentially, I stole this kid's name. But he tapped out, right? Like, I gave up. And then I walked away, and he fucking jumped me from the back yeah. again for round two because he, like, couldn't, you know, couldn't accept that he lost to a kid that was, like, a couple years younger than him. And at that point, I just fucking, I, kids had to pull me off this kid because I was going to fucking kill him. You know what I'm saying? Like, to be that, like, on so many levels, that was fucking cheating. You already said I'm done. I had you in a fucking chokehold. You were done. You tapped out. Yeah. And then you still come and attack. Like, to me, that, like, while my back is turned after the fight's over. Yeah. So there was plenty of shit like that that happened. Um, but 
for the most part, it wasn't like that. Uh, you know, once it was over, it was over. But I think that's that's the harder thing for older kids to digest. Like, if you got beat up by a kid younger than you, it's like, you know, it did such a thing to your ego. Because oh. then, like, all the other kids would probably, like, clown on you. But if it was, like, pretty much the same age, it wasn't as much of a thing. But, yeah, like, we we would we would choke people out <clears throat> completely, you know? If, if, they wouldn't, if they wouldn't tap out, you were going to faint them. Okay, but um, so t- but explain this bugging out thing. You told Sapir, you just told the story about this kid that went and tried to hide in the dirty laundry. And poor and I remember one time you told me you guys had a term for kids who would like bug out and lose it. It was some weird term. They become a that, scuzz. Like, they become a scuzz. Yeah. So so t- <laughs> tell me about this phenomenon. Like what what is a scuzz? What do they do? How do they become like that? Yeah, so, Sapir. Okay, so what was yours? Well, so what I, what I noticed was, and I've talked to a lot of people about all this shit post India and you either had to redirect what happened to you in this way so you could be okay with it. Right. Yeah. Like your existence was pretty fucked up, but if you don't restructure that somehow and be okay with what it was, you were going to fucking bug out. Like you couldn't like the amount of rage that people had from some of these uh, interactions or like, you know, like it was, it was kind of like if you were one of those kids that fell down to such a low rung, right? You just, you couldn't be okay with it. Like, and it was, and, and you know, the same thing, like there were kids that just fucking went insane. And I, and, and those kids that were older than me, if I saw them walking into school somewhere, I would fucking run the other direction. And I was the kind of kid that regardless of who you were, I would usually try and fuck with you. Like I would, I would do this, this, this thing we talk about, it's called punga taking. I don't know if there's a proper translation to English, but the idea, it means that you're fucking with somebody asking for a beating. Like clearly, you know, they can like give you a good whooping and you still like talk some shit to them. And like, you know, they try and like run you down. And for me, it's like, I always knew I could escape because I, I could like dive through like little like fences and shit like that. And, um, so I used to have people chase me all the time, but there was a, a few people that were clearly fucking insane. And then this one guy fucking, he, he took me, I was at the time I was probably like nine years old and he grabbed me by my ankles, right? Grabbed me by my fucking ankles and held me off a four story building like this. So I'm staring down fucking below and he would do this thing like, Oh, oh like I'm going to drop you kind of shit. And like based on his like mental state you're just like bro like this kid could just fucking drop you like there was no level of trust this isn't a fucking game but like you were like i think i'm gonna fucking die yeah and so like those kind of guys that were like you knew when there there were people that were kind of grounded and then there was people that were fucking like like gonna snap and those guys that were like kind of like not knowing it's the same thing with dogs too like when you think the dog's gonna bite for real because he's bugging out like it was that kind of behavior that you'd see. So all those dudes that were like that, there's like a handful of them uh, that I would just try and avoid. You know, and if they were my age, I, I would care because I was going to like fight them or whatever. But like those other guys that were, you know, six, seven years older than me, yeah, you just avoid those dudes at all costs. Like, okay, so you, you, you said that right when you started what you were saying, you were like, the shit was so fucked up that you either had to direct it in a way or you would bug out. Just say a little bit about the shit was so fucked up. Like, what was it that made the people that didn't cope? What was it that made them uh, fall apart? I mean, I would say it's a combination of like, like the stressors from like everyday life. Um, but I, but I think it, I think of what probably was it was the ranking. It yeah. was it was the, the people that didn't have that tight bond. Like you know you know, essentially all these people became your family, right? And so you had these really tight connections, but every once in a while there was kids that were kind of like outcasts. And that was like what McCormick was talking about is being a fucking scuzz, being fucking nasty. Um, you know what I mean? Like when you just stopped showering for months and your hair was like rat nesty and and you were just like scabies and, and like all that shit. I, I don't know the actual state because like I never like went that up. Like I never like experienced it like that. Like, yeah, like we were dirty and stuff, but I never, for me, it was always like, you know, all the shit that I took on to me, I just turned it into a game. Like if you got me now, you were a teacher giving me a thrashing or whatever you were doing. I knew that you weren't going to be able to break me. 
like for whatever reason, I was like, I'm still going to get you back. And that's me like sneaking into the classroom and taking a piss all over the chalkboard, all over the teacher's chairs, like all these things, like to the teachers that would like really like thrash you up. Like I was like, don't worry, I'll get you. And I would just kind of keep score <laughs> the whole time. So I, I don't really know. I don't know what fully drove them to that place, but I, it's like, it's gotta be a combination of all those things. Yeah. I think that point you make of, of the falling in the social hierarchy, which then leads to a, it almost like a, a structured, um, it's not segregated, but like a ostracized position, right? Where, where you become an actual outcast, but it's different because as you're an outcast, if you're in America and you, in you become an outcast, you're only there for how long? How long are you in school, Dave? Like eight hours in in the U.S. Uh, it typically it's like from nine to three. Oh, right, and then you and then you go home. But in this case, we're in class probably the same amount of time, nine to three, and that's the only time teachers are around. And then you're there for the rest of the twenty four hour cycle with no teachers. It's there's no one there, and as you point out, that your parents are on the other side of the world. And if you want to, if you want to say like, Oh, I feel really bad. You write, you can write a letter and it'll get to them two weeks later. And then they'll try to write you back in, in a month later. You'll hear that they're not going to save you. And it's like yeah. that for, for some reason, like if you didn't figure out a way to create an allegiance within like, and I remember, I remember some pretty sad moments in there where you, you, you you're like somehow in the middle of the year and then you just are, you're kind of linked up with one other kid and you have this kind of allegiance going on where you're trying to just like survive um and then uh but but that that's like a fleeting idea because there were so many other things where you're not just surviving instead the whole world has turned into a game of pull tag and you don't care about school or anything like it's just some bizarre all the kids are involved in some some crazy heist or some bizarre like uh some some like makeshift game that then sweeps the entire school do you remember that shit dude the games yeah i mean it's so awesome that we didn't have fucking tv video games and all the shit you kind of have today because and and that was I mean, I'm sure we would have liked it, but we didn't have the option to even get into that. So we were just really, the games, fucking dude, it was so much fun. And one of my favorite games <clears throat> was the game Tuppa. It's kind of like, like I Spy, like kind of tag type of game, but like <laughs> the way we ended up playing it was we played at night after dinner, um, like on the weekends. And we were all, you know, told to go back to our dorms because like, the teachers didn't want us like running around the school and you couldn't see people in the shadows and it's a huge campus. Right. So what we would do is we'd start playing this game and we had this kind of, a, we had this like unspoken rule that once, once the staff came out looking for us, which they always did, is that it was every man for himself and that was the new game is to get back to your room without getting caught by these teachers. And they just like elevated, you know, the intensity of the game because if they caught you, man, you were going to get you were going to get something and it was never going to be good. So for us, it became so like fucking sneaky. And I remember I was hanging out with some of these older kids one night and there was this one fucking bitch. Um, I don't know how to explain her. She was the burliest woman you've ever met in your entire life. She had all types of like um, collegiate level training. She knew how to uh, throw discus, javelin. She was kind of like the sports coach for the girls, but she was a very strong Punjabi woman that was ruthless. And she was just like some of the other teachers was like so fucking tough when she gave the slaps and we fucking hated her. And you know, she had broken English. Like if you don't go to your straight to my dorms, I will broke you. <laughs> like she would talk like that. Like she's like, Oh, like she was this character. Um, I don't know if you've seen that kids movie, I think it's called Matilda or something where there, there's this really strong German woman and she's got the kid by her, by her braids and she's swinging him around. Like, and like, that's the kind of woman she was. She was just somebody that was like dangerous as hell. And, uh, and I just remember we were on the side of, of the principal's office. So there was probably about, I want to say about 60 feet between where she was standing 
and we were creeping in the garden and this kid had this fucking firecracker that he was gonna lob over this garden and try and hit this lady because she was fucking insane. And so we're there, we're there lighting this shit and I go to run to hide because I was like, oh, I need a few extra seconds, right? Just to like get into a good spot because I know they're coming here. They're gonna start looking for us. And right when I turned the corner, they had already started to run like the, the, the teacher this, this woman and, and her whole staff, like all these, she was there with like four, like a gate guard, all these people were gonna come to get us. But I hid right then, right when they all turned the corner. And I just remember like, they caught all my friends, they flipped the lights on, there was two lights going, it was all of a sudden like lit up like this like fucking garden juggling. And I'm just hiding there and like, you know, the idea is that like, you know, it's a religious school and I'm like praying to God that they don't fucking catch me. And I had this idea that I was like fucking invisible. I was just projecting that I'd be like, unseen and the fucking gate guard who's all in his like you know get up comes he pulls back the thing like where i was hiding behind these tall grasses or whatever some kind of bush he looks right fucking through me i don't know how that's even possible that he didn't see me but i just didn't move and i remember all my friends were getting caned and they were fucking duck walking back like fucking 400 yards back to the dorm they were saying all the kids were gonna get expelled and all this shit i was fucking terrified but i was like somehow i was like fucking invisible dog dave, dave you- do you like that that sapir just said this was my favorite game <laughs> that's what he just said dude that's what he just said right isn't that fucking amazing like just think about is. how extraordinary that is it's such a different state of consciousness that you guys were in the, the mode of consciousness that all of you guys were in india is so different than the mode of consciousness that like your son and my son are in yes totally and and stop here like what about your little guys right like, you can't replicate this, but you still, like, I still have this tendency where I don't want my kid to grow up and be a pussy, right? But then, it's like... Oh, I, I want my kids to be fucking nerds, like, for sure. Like, yeah, well, like I, I just want them, like... <laughs> wait, wait, what? <laughs> not dealing with any of this shit. Wait, wait, wait which part? Wait, I, you mean you don't want their, you don't, fa- their favorite game? You don't game? want your kids to have to deal with all this fighting and stuff? I mean, it's funny, they're... Right now they're four and a half and they fight among their twins and they fight amongst themselves. And like my whole solution now is like, oh, I'm going to get them into jujitsu or teach them like to like respect the thing. And it's not like an emotional thing where you, where you fight out of anger, but it's more of just like, okay, like you're going to learn how to control people's digits and be kind to people. Like that's more my thing. Like I, I pretty much started, stopped fighting when I was like 20 years old. Like I was like, dude, I'm not fighting anymore. It's not. There's no value in it. Why? Why thing. did like, you? That, why did you stop? What happened? Why? Well, I think the last dude that I beat up, he ended up murdering his father, <laughs> and that was like that, Jesus that was Christ. Horrible. Are you fucking serious? Mm-hmm. He was a kid that I went to school with in India. Like we were still all hanging out. He clearly bugged out, and uh, yeah, he's institutionalized somewhere. I mean, that, so my, my buddy sent me. You know, the news article, and I watched all the content, all the videos about this guy's life, and I was like, fuck, dude. And uh, I remember even then, when I got into it with him, it was because he was bugging out, and he was, like, disrespecting, like, the girls that were hanging out at my house, and it was just, like, not a good thing. But I was just like, I mean, what I noticed about violence and, like, really doing bad shit to people is it stays with you. Like, you think, oh, it's going to be cool to kick somebody's ass. Like, I don't think it is. I think it's pretty fucked up. And and you just you just replay these things in your mind all the time and it just doesn't leave it never left me with a good feeling you just it keeps you like more like clenched up and like that and it's like dude like it's just not a good feeling like i don't i don't like that it's like stayed with me for so long you know what i mean yeah yeah dude i have a super strange theory that i want both your guys help with right and i think maybe this is a good place to 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 bring it up, right? And and here's what here's what I'm basically struggling to, to figure out is like, do you think it's possible that having this kind of strange reality where you act out physical aggression for real and you have this like a place where you really did starve, you really did struggle, and the primary part of your life was try to get calories so you don't die or go into some kind of super malnourished place, and then you think like, like 
I, this is only coming up because now I'm I'm currently feeling really sick, right? And so then in, in my mind, I'm like, oh, I feel really sick. But then I'm like, oh, but I'm okay because I have this place in my brain or in my self-concept where I'm like, mm-hmm. I can do hardship, right? Like I can handle hardship. And then, but I guess this may be a question. I, I want both your opinions, right? Because uh, this is where I'm stuck because uh, do you think it's possible that it could be advantageous to go through through difficult things in your in your life versus like a, a life that would be more charmed and less str- uh, struggle. Did, did, was that clear? I'm I'm struck. Yep, to, I, I understood it clearly. You want to respond first, Sot Beer? You want me to? Oh, go for it, Jason. Uh, yeah, I definitely think so. But I think it's this tricky thing. So there's sort of like. Um, I can imagine kind of a uh, a gauge, and it could you could be it could be too soft. You didn't have enough hardship, so you don't know that you can handle hardship. But then there could be too hard, where like the hardship f- just fucks you up and makes you crumble, like these kids you're saying that bugged out. And and so there's this tricky middle ground of like where you have enough hardship, so you can experience it but you can tolerate it and you can gradually experience that you're strong enough to deal with the hardship and i think humans need to be in that and those kids in at your schools that bugged out the the trauma got the best of them and these kids that grow up um in too spoiled or whatever honestly they're almost as bad off as the kids that bugged out i work with a lot of those kids where the parents just like totally cater to them and they just become these like spoiled whiny kids that whine when they don't get what they want and then they go to school and since they're spoiled and whiny the other kids start bullying them oh yeah and they have they don't know what to do back but just kind of whine and bitch more and then it's just a bad cycle of negative reinforcement yes and see that's what i think is the american version of a dejected scuzz is that kid because right. he go, that kid goes to school and then rather than have any kind of a, a, a self to contribute, they are just kind of a, uh, well, the other kids fucking hate them, right? They despise them. And so then they get, they can't, they won't be allowed to sit with anyone at lunch. They have to go sit in the library or the, the principal makes them sit with them. I've heard all those stories too, right? And it's like, they're not even being beaten every day, but then they end up similarly dejected and suicidal. I, that, that's a pretty common thing in our rich country. What, what, dude, what is going on where you, you take all these... You, you would think raising kids in this Lord of the Flies scenario that Sapir and I are talking about, you could see that people might get fucked up and then become unstable, but... I don't think they're any more unstable. Maybe, you know what? This is probably not true. It's probably not. But No, they're probably more unstable, but the ones we're talking about, the spoiled ones, they're quite fucked up too. Yes. Yeah. I think that... Um, but so then, uh, like, if we go back to my strange concept where it's like having a place in your... In your... Um, where, where it's like, it's almost like your, your own personal story where you're like, oh, it, um, but see, a, as you were explaining your childhood, Dave, you don't have a bunch of stuff where you're like, oh, you had to go and confront these bullies that were picking on you. And so you finally fucking beat them up and then everyone cheers. And it's like, you don't have that, but you seem entirely stable. Like, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting question, and let's let's use my son because his life is even much more much easier than mine. Um, and so, what I tried to do with my son, who's who's doing, he, he's fifteen now, and he's clearly doing really well and is going to do well. But I just made sure that he knows that he doesn't get what he wants, and he has to work to get what he wants, and that life doesn't come easy. And if if you work. Um, and if you're respectful for others, he kind of goes into the world knowing that he needs to be very respectful of others. He doesn't get what he wants. He needs to work to get what he wants. He needs to be respectful and kind of others. And that's worked out well for him. 
Um, and it's been a way easier path than you guys had. Um, so yeah, you don't, I don't know how much hardship you need, but you definitely need to learn that the world doesn't just give you what you want if you whine up for it. But okay, let me, let me go back to your guys' story. Sapir, in uh, a couple of times, it's like, I, it's like I heard Sapir saying, um, describing what most people would think is, are the most fucked up abusive, deprived circumstances, and it sounds to me like Sapir turned it into, like, a game, and that he, that Sapir, you were, like, you had your, like, comrade, your, your comrades, and you were in it with a tribe, and it was a game, and so you were dealing with this in super intense hardship, but it was all within the container of, like, your crew, and you guys were going to turn it into, like, a game or a contest or something. Yeah, yeah. So when you were saying that, this little memory popped into my head, and it was, you know, the kind of thing where we were hanging out in the dorm, and because we were bored, we had to come up with all these things to do, all these games. And for a while, like, I got into like booby trapping doors and putting like, you know, plastic containers of water on top of shit when somebody went to the stall to, you know, use the bathroom. This water would fall on their heads. And I kind of got like really out of control with that. And I was like, that's all I thought about for a few days. And there was a kid in my room who was out doing whatever. It's probably like 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. So the lights were already off and this kid wasn't in his bed. And he was an older kid in our dorm, but he was somebody that we'd always like goof around with. So me and my buddy, we set up this like mug, right? But there wasn't any water at the time because sometimes the, you know, had water issues and there was power outages, there was all these things, but there was always like, somebody had like a bucket of dirty laundry that they'd started to like wash some clothes, but they forgot about it. So there was always like a way to get water. And so like, I remember like we fished out this dirty, like, you know, uh, dirty clothes water and we put it up on top of this door and we had all these like nalas, it's like a type of string and we'd like made it so he was like, I don't know if this was really gonna work to begin with, but you know, he was going to trip over this line, it was going to do this, and then the water was going to fall on some other kid's head, and we were just really, like, trying to rig it up, me and my buddy, and out of the corner of my eyes, I saw this fucking silhouette out on the veranda of this person watching us doing what we were doing, because, like, we, the lights were off, and there was a little bit of lights kind of going, but we were kind of, like, creeping around. All of a sudden, I saw the reflection off this guy's glasses, and I was like, oh, fuck, it was our house master, right? And so this guy kicks the door and the mug falls and he, and he's like, you idiots. And like, we were totally busted. We had one mug that had fallen and then we still had another mug because it was going to dump on the other dude's head or some, some elaborate scheme. And he's like, what are you doing? You're putting urine in there. And he's like, he's like, we're like, sir, it's not urine. He's like, then drink it, drink it. And like, we're like, no, like we can't drink it. And then he just like starts slapping us. Right. And, and you know, the move was like, so he just slapped me across my face. And I immediately, like as the best fucking actor I was just immediately burst into tears crying. Clearly it didn't hurt, but because I cried, he starts beating on my buddy like harder. And like, he kind of like left me because I was like, I was like a weakling. <laughs> and so meanwhile, my, my buddy's getting like beaten by this guy. He's like, oh, oh, and he looks up at me and I'm just standing back like this, flicking my buddy off, just like letting him know that, you know, he's the one that lost this shit. Like I totally fucking like, schooled him on being like the better actor to get out of a beating. And it was just like shit like that. And clearly afterwards, like, you know, he was laughing about it too, but it was, it was always like that. If you were the better actor, you could get out of shit and just like, it was fun. Cause like sometimes you were on the other end of that and they're like that motherfucker. So it was that kind of vibe of making it a game. And like people look at it like it's such a bad thing, but I don't know, you guys can tell me if this is accurate. I, I read somewhere that physical abuse isn't as bad as um, like verbal abuse. Like the physical abuse, like it, the pain comes and goes, but the like the mental shit stays with you much longer. So like, yeah, like, you know, getting clacked with a stick or whatever, like, it stings, it hurts, but then it's kind of gone. Is that is that accurate? Well, I, my, my response to you saying that is your experience was that. It's like there's abuse of this or that, but you're turning it into a game or a contest and you're going to try to beat the other people. And so, yeah, what you're saying worked for you. But then I'm thinking about the kid that bugged out <laughs> and that dude had this different experience. He probably was just like imprisoned in endless abuse that he had no control over and he just was like sinking in it. 
Yes. And so just your, your interpretation of the abuse makes it so that you did fine, whereas the dude who bugged out ended up killing his dad, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. So that's an interesting t- thing too, guy kind of like paralleling our lives. I had this other friend um, who grew up in our community. Like there was a bunch of kids that were part of our ashrams, part of our group, but never actually went over to school with us. But we'd still see them in the summer and they were like cool, like we'd hang out. And I just remember having the realization, I was like, oh, like you went home after you went to school and got to be around this like loving, supportive family. And you know, like a lot of our families are kind of like hippie-ish or whatever. And so like, like you didn't have to deal with any of this shit like after school hours. I mean, for me, it was, it was like that. Um, I just remember, you know, I was probably one of the older kids in the junior dorms when I first went there. So I'd be in a room with like 40 plus people and the way that you kind of maintain your hierarchy and, and the status is you never let anybody kind of like clown on you. you. You just never let anybody get the best of you. So mm-hmm. for me, that meant I was like in the corner of the room. I had my spot. Like I was kind of like, you had to be strategic about where you slept. And so like, if you were smart, you would get in a good location so you could have all the vantage points. You knew you could like pop out this window or get into some shit. You know, you would just have to like think through all these scenarios and then you just, wouldn't go to sleep you'd be like one of the last people to go to sleep and like the people that went to sleep early were the dudes we fucked with and it wasn't like you fuck with the americans or indians like anybody who went to sleep first always got fucked with so that was like rule number one don't go to sleep and i remember like you know every once in a while like we're kids we're running around all day like that's all i did was playing games skateboarding fucking you know pre-parkour kind of shit, jumping off buildings, like whatever we did, we climbed four-story buildings on, on the pipes at the back there. And so every once in a while, you were just like exhausted. I remember falling asleep sometimes and just like passing out. And I remember one night I was in this other dorm with like older kids and I woke up and there was all these kids laughing at me. And I was like, what the fuck? Like I was out like, like kind of like dazed and like my hair was all like over the place. and. I was like, what the fuck are these guys laughing? I I wouldn't say that. I just thought that. I couldn't figure it out. I was like, whatever. And so the lights were still on and I just went to like put my head back down on my pillow and I woke over and my fucking whole pillow is on fire. This motherfucker just lit my shit on fire while I was sleeping. And like you're here with like flames coming up by your face. And that was like the thing. It was like that became a thing for that week that these older kids were out of control with fireworks. They they would duct tape... uh, I don't know what you'd call it in this country. We call them like anar. It was a, a fountain. And so you just have like a, you know, like if you're supposed to stand up normally so it looks like a volcano and it's just like shooting up. You do this outside, obviously, but these fuckers would duct tape it to the side of the wall over somebody's bed. So you wake wow. up, like, fire, fire. And there's oh all this gosh. like shit like flying onto your bed. And like we had sleeping bags and beddings that would like fucking catch on fire. And would be like, wow. you know, it was, it was fucked up, but it was still like if you were the guy that was getting dusty, it was kind of like, yo, yeah, dude, like. Like everybody kind of had a good laugh. It wasn't like super traumatic in that way because like it wasn't always like, oh, this is the asshole that gets fucked with. Like everybody got fucked with. So it wasn't just like, I'm going to single you out and be like a straight bully. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. It's like, however you shape it up in your mind, it becomes a reality. So it's like, yo, do I go this way or do I go that way? It's like, you decide. Yeah. Well, and the reality is it's a big difference between the one way and the other way. Um, hey guys, I got an appointment right now, so I got a, a bolt. If you want to keep going, go for it, and I can just duck out. All right, cool, man. Cool. It's, uh, that was awesome. It was great to meet you. The, your stories, I'm, it's weird because I'm almost like envious. Like I'm like, damn, I wish I was there, which is so crazy. You know? Isn't that <laughs> yeah. such a weird reaction? Yes. Oh, shit, man. Yeah, that's fucking Yeah, you got you to see... You got to see some of the visuals. That's why I want to send it over to you guys, and I'll, I'll I, probably just edit it up a little bit and just so you I can't can wait see, to like. I can't wait to see that. Mm-hmm. All right, Sapir, it was great uh, meeting you, and thanks for sharing those stories. I loved it. I'll catch you guys later. Of All right, man. Of course, Take care. Bye bye.